Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour. Hi, Hi Professor uh, Margaret Brando. You are here? Yeah. Nice. We see you. But please unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, let me see. I might put a different background. <laughs> it's okay. So many it's to it is. from. Hi, Dr. Munira Masmoudi. Yeah, but uh, as the mics are uh, off, so if you if you want to speak, you should unmute yourself so we can hear you. Hello, Adnan. You are changing your background, Professor Brando. <laughs> yes, this is, well, the last one was a picture of my vacation. I went yeah. to Hawaii. Uh, one of my former, Very students, nice. one of my former students lives there. So um, I went to Hawaii and that's the beach. But um, this is a picture of my building in the springtime. Ah, uh, okay. So. I'm not at the office, I'm at home, but it makes you feel like you've been to the office. Yeah, here, here uh, 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 in Tunisia, it's uh, 5 p.m. So I think that everyone is at home now, almost, I think. So uh, uh, we are yeah, very, very uh, honored, Professor Margaret, to have you uh, as a first speaker. Thank you very much. We'll wait just a few, uh, I would say a few uh, minutes, two perhaps minutes. And how and long, how long do you want me to speak for? As you like, Professor. Okay. Actually, as you like. Okay. Hello, so everyone. This... I hope that the Zoom will hold on for uh, 40 minutes, I think. It's okay, okay it's on this. It's okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, um. So, Professor uh, Brando, so just to uh, begin. Actually, I'm just for everyone. So, hi, everyone. I see that uh, many of uh, members of the group are here. So, uh, nice to meet you online. <laughs> So just I'm, I'm Dr. Safa Halai, uh, and uh, I'm an associate professor of the National Engineering School uh, of Tunis here in Tunisia. And I'm the chair of uh, the African working group um, of, uh, of in healthcare systems. And uh, this is actually a new um, group uh, um, we begin our activities uh, in April 2021, so it's uh, a kind of new, uh, young, uh, actually, uh, group. Uh, we are almost all our experts and uh, health professionals. And uh, it, we are um, officially uh, about 15 members. Uh, uh, almost, we, are, we have... Um, uh, many members here in Tunisia, but we have members from uh, Canada, uh, from Middle East, uh, from France. Um, <laughs> I hope that I didn't forget the others. <laughs> but it's all about it's almost about uh, uh, nice people with wonderful minds <laughs> around the world <laughs> who love Africa and who works on related fields uh, to uh, healthcare. So uh, we are very, very uh, excited. This is our first seminar online. And uh, we have two speakers today. We have Professor Margaret Brando and we have Dr. Uh, Sanar Ayed. So uh, Dr. Brando, 
I, I, I begin by introducing you. Okay, sounds good. You have a, an outstanding biography, so I don't know how to, to I begin, but uh, you are Professor Margaret Rando, so you are a Coleman Fink Professor of uh, Engineering and the Professor of Medicine by courtesy at Stanford University. Uh, actually, uh, Professor, uh, uh, you received many awards and prizes, and um, especially the award of the advancement of women, of women in operation research and management science. So just to quote a few, but I liked very much this surprise. So uh, uh, we are very honored to receive you. And you are currently an informs diversity, equity, and inclusion ambassador. So uh, right. thank you very much yeah, to, uh, for being part of this uh, event. Thank you very much. Actually, well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'd love it if one day I could come visit in person, but for now we'll have our Zoom talk. Um, but really, it's so great to share ideas with people who are also interested in healthcare systems. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you see this? Yours? Can you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I've prepared. I, uh, this, I will add just one uh, little uh, remark. Yes. So, can so please, uh, we have the, the Zoom issue. So I don't know if uh, the Zoom will let us uh, uh, with, will let our uh, our meeting be uh, uh, above forty minutes. So if you have uh, some issues, I will say you or uh, uh, some this will uh, will write this in our uh, in the discussion to say that we will stop now and we will reconnect just in few seconds okay and and secondly uh, if you have any question and i know that uh, there will be uh, very interesting questions so if you have questions you can write them in the discussion um, message or you can ask them uh, directly after the talk of uh, professor brando and uh, actually with the nice surprise was that professor brando speaks french too so if you Mais have pas très bien. Yes. Assez bien, oui. <laughs> pas très bien. Yeah. So if you have any question, please, in French or in English, please go ahead. This is the point of uh, this seminar. Okay. So, so the floor is yours, Professor. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. As I say, it's really a pleasure to be here and to share ideas. So, um, we at Stanford and in my department have been doing a number of projects with one of our hospitals. Our university has two hospitals, uh, a, a children's hospital and an adult hospital. And at our children's hospital, we have a, a colleague, David Schenker, who has a PhD in math and is very interested in improving hospital operations using analytics. So we've been doing these projects for about oh, four or five years. And so David and I thought it would be useful to write up a document describing our analytical projects, and in particular, our successes, our failures, and our opportunities. So that's what I'm going to talk about is some insights into things that worked, things that didn't work in trying to implement analytics project in a hospital. So first, I'll give you an overview of, of our, our projects. Uh, that's the abbreviation for our hospital name, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Uh, then I'm going to talk about successes and failures. We view um, success as consisting of four steps that have to be achieved. First, achieving stakeholder buy-in, then solving the technical problem, then implementing the model, and then using the model on a sustained basis. So I'm gonna talk about uh, various uh, projects and how they did or didn't succeed at each of these steps. Uh, then I'm going to summarize the lessons learned and then conclude with some thoughts. So let me first tell you a little bit about our projects. So I mentioned that we have a children's hospital. It was just renovated. This is the beautiful new building. Um, it's a pediatric academic medical center, which has 360 beds. It's right here on our campus. 
it's a so-called level one trauma facility. So that means like it will take any, any sort of trauma, like the highest level of trauma, we have the support for that. We have about 13,000 admissions per year and about 6,600 surgeries per year. So that is our children's hospital. So what are some of the challenges at our hospital? Well, the first thing, I want to be more positive. So I'm going to call them the opportunities at our hospital, not the challenges. Um, so we believe that at our medical center, we provide cutting edge clinical care. We can do some amazing you know, surgeries and transplants and um, uh, cancer treatments. So really cutting edge clinical care. But like many medical centers in the US and probably elsewhere, we know that built into our system, we just have waste and inefficiency. Um, an Institute of Medicine report in the US said, estimated that 30 to 40 cents of every dollar spent on health care is really wasted. It's covering cost of overuse, underuse, misuse, et cetera, inefficiency, et cetera. So we know we have that. More than that, we probably have outmoded management systems. Now, this is not an actual picture of how we do patient records. Um, we, we have electronic medical records. But nonetheless, we think that our management systems are somewhat outmoded. So yes, cutting edge care, but maybe we could modernize our systems and, and get rid of waste and inefficiency. So the goal of our projects is to use practice-based evidence, uh, in other words, you know, use data from the hospital to empower better decisions, and in particular to empower data-driven decisions about clinical and operational uh, factors. So clinical, how do you treat the patient? Operational, how do you run the system? But so that's our, our idea. We're going to use analytics and data to improve clinical and operational decisions. So let me give you an example because I think it's quite illuminating. Uh, this is a uh, picture of pediatric heart surgery at our hospital. OK, so, uh, this is an actual photograph from the operating room. So our children's hospital does specialized surgery to repair congenital heart defects in newborns. This is one of the few hospitals in the world that can do this. And there's an average wait of about 11 months for this surgery. The surgery is super delicate. It typically requires about 18 hours. And before the surgery, uh, about 100 hours of imaging have been performed. So really, this is as technically complex and coordinated as anything NASA does, you know, in trying to send a rocket to the moon. So super sophisticated, cutting edge, fantastic work. But for this particular procedure, the scheduling is still done in a big leather book with sticky notes. So when a surgery has to be canceled, for example, the child has the flu, um, it's very difficult in this manual system to create a new schedule. So this kind of highlights the shortcomings of using old, old technology, you know, a leather bound book, to support the absolute newest technology. So this is just an illustration of the kind of problem we would like to fix. So we have created a uh, collaboration known as SURF. And I'm not referring to surfing, although my colleague David is a big surfer. And so he said, um, our acronym for our um, collaboration has to be SURF. We're just going to find words that fit it. So um, it stands for Systems Utilization Research for Stanford Medicine. Um, and we have a website, surf.stanford.edu. And by the way, I'd be happy to share my slides afterwards so you don't have to write this down in case you're interested. But anyway, we have a website describing our project. So SURF is a collaboration between the hospital Stanford School of Medicine, like the medical school professors, and my department, Management Science and Engineering. And as I mentioned, our goal is to facilitate the delivery of cutting edge advances in medical care through advances in hospital operations. Um, and we use a range of analytical techniques, the things you would know from operations research. We use machine learning, optimization, simulation, statistics, probability, computational tools, lots of Lots and lots of things that are directly in the INFORMS wheelhouse. So we use many different techniques. 
Um, what about our projects? So our projects are always done by teams. And all the teams include our hospital analytics director, who's David, um, a clinical partner, so somebody at the hospital, either a physician or a nurse, and then students, one or more students from my department, from the medical school, or even from Stanford Business School. Um, and then some project teams will in also include a faculty member like me or my colleague, Peter Glenn, or other, other faculty members. So we have project teams. Um, projects range in duration from one quarter, you know, one academic quarter, so I don't know, 10 weeks roughly, to several years. So it might be a class project done in one quarter, or it might be a PhD student working on it, and it takes several years. So a variety of types of projects. So our projects uh, target various parts of the care process. So let me just give you an overview. So we think about projects in the areas of patient access and telemedicine, projects relating to procedures and diagnostics, projects related to intensive care or acute care, in other words, care in the hospital, and projects relating to discharges, as well as overarching projects related to decision support. So for example, uh, we're developing a personalized diabetes management system. In the area of procedures and diagnostics, we look at things like, like surgical supplies, surgical duration, uh, operating room utilization. And I'll talk a little more about each of these in a moment. Scheduling surgical procedures, scheduling infusions of, of uh, um, cancer drugs and other things. Uh, in terms of patient care, looking at central line associated bloodstream infections, monitoring high cost drug usage, which patients are at in, in patients are at risk of developing chronic kidney disease, which patients may be about to uh, have a severe clinical decline. And then uh, we also have sort of more managerial things like forecasting the hospital-wide patient flow and automating workload decision support for billing, et cetera. Um, so just, I'll tell you briefly about some of our projects. So in patient access and telemedicine, one thing we're doing is trying to design a comprehensive system to uh, monitor remote device use and then develop methods to track and analyze data from these devices. So here's a child who has um, type one diabetes uh, and she has a continuous glucose monitor, which is on this uh, little device. And this data gets fed up to a smartphone, which gets fed to the hospital. How do we use that information? Um, Similarly, uh, so that, that's broader, and then this is specific to the diabetes management. So, so that's the kind of things we're working on telemedicine. Oops, sorry. Um, procedures and diagnostics. A lot of our projects here, not all, but relate to the operating room. And this is an actual photograph of our one of our operating rooms. Um, so for example, managing surgical supplies, um, you know, what do you need on the supply cart when a patient gets surgery? Uh, how long will a surgery take? Forecasting the duration of surgery. Uh, scheduling procedures. So uh, how, how should I schedule my procedures across the, uh, the, the operating rooms? Uh, improving operating room utilization. Um, how, how, how can we think about block time for the operating rooms and which surgery should be done at which times. Uh, we're working on a project about scheduling infusions. So if a child has cancer, for example, they have to have infusion of uh, chemotherapy drugs. Uh, and so they, they sit in these chairs as an actual photograph. Um, uh, we have seven of these. And the question is, how, how can we schedule them most efficiently? Uh, another project, uh, monitoring and reducing central line associated bloodstream infections or so-called CLABSIs. Um, high cost drug usage. We want to figure out some drugs cost a huge amount of money. So we'd like to analyze data to figure out when such drugs are appropriate and then develop best practices for using high quality, lo uh, lower cost medications if needed and appropriate. Um, 
we have a project super interesting about identifying inpatients who may be at who have acute kidney injury when they're in the hospital. That just means they're sick fundamentally. But those who might be at risk of later developing chronic kidney disease. Um, how can we use online real-time information from the patient's medical record to do this prediction? Uh, analyzing patients at risk of clinical de decline. I'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, discharges, we're looking at things like forecasting the patient flow in the daily census. Uh, Target-based care. Um, if a patient has had this surgery uh, in, let's say our target might be in one day, they should be out of their bed and walking. In two days, they should be able to walk down the hall, whatever. And so the idea here is to define milestones and then implement them. And then finally, in decision support, we're trying to do things like automating um, uh, many things, such as patient care, nurse workloads, and billing. So that is a very brief, high-level overview of the kinds of projects we're doing. We're doing other projects as well, but that gives you a flavor. But now, the focus of my talk, as I mentioned, is about successes and failures and what we've learned. So I'd like to talk about that now. So the first thing is, how do you define success? Well, we define it in the following way. It's sustained value. So this involves the following steps. First, you have to have stakeholder buy-in. That is the people at the hospital have to wanna do it. Um, and of course, if physicians, administrators or information services don't cooperate or engage with the project, then you're totally gonna fail. The second step is solving the technical problem, right? And that's what we as operations researchers do. You know, we develop an optimization model or whatever it is we're doing, a simulation model to solve the problem. Um, of course, if the solution doesn't work for whatever reason, then it's not gonna provide value. Uh, so let's say this technical problem has been solved. The next step is to implement it, to have the hospital implement it. Um, now, uh, sometimes projects are too technically complex, they disrupt workflows, there may be many reasons why a project is not implemented. And in fact, most analytics projects for hospitals are never implemented. Um, okay, so it's implemented, but now it has to be used on a sustained basis. So it can't just be, I, I turned this on and we used it, it has to be something that continues to be used. Um, and there may be reasons why this does not happen. It might be too difficult to maintain. People who have the system just might not have incentives to use it, lots of reasons. But let's say sustained use happens. Then we would call that uh, a success and we would want to measure the value. So we call that sustained value. So that's kind of the process we have realized is, is sort of the four steps of, um, success. So now what I'd like to talk about is each of these four steps and projects we had that did or did not succeed. Because remember, this talk is not, not just about successes, but about failures. And I'm sure we've all experienced some failures in projects we've tried to do. So stakeholder buy-in. Um, I think pretty much for our projects, we've not experienced failures just because David, our analytics director at the hospital, uh, works with people who want us to solve their problem. And so already we have people who've bought in. But nonetheless, here are some of the lessons we have, have learned. Um, we, we, I mentioned we always have a partnership. So it's not us going in and saying, here's your solution. It's a working partnership. We all work together. I mentioned that we work in project teams, uh, uh, David Schenker being the leader as he's at the hospital, people from the hospital, the physicians and nurses, faculty members, students, but widely inclusive. Um, now, an important thing here is project selection. Uh, so the first thing we've learned is that, that whatever project you do has to match the priorities of the institution. It has to be something that the hospital thinks is important. It also, of course, since we're operations researchers, it has to be a project where analytics can add value. It's not just um, 
uh, you know, that we want this work done, but something where we can add value. And then I think another important thing is we have to have aligned incentives. It may be that the hospital just wants the project solved and, and you know, a good solution. And it may be that the faculty members say from management science and engineering or the students want a publication. And so we have to make sure that everybody understands what the incentives are and that they're aligned. Uh, and we found success in identifying people who are passionate about analytics. So people at the hospital, you know, as you can imagine, there are relatively few physicians who understand mathematical optimization in analytics. So you have to find people who at least are understand and, and are passionate about the idea that maybe we could use some kind of data analytics optimization to, to solve our problems. And then what, another thing we found is you have to start with a focused and technically modest goal. So our very first project back in the day, I don't know, five years ago or whatever, was using machine learning to predict the duration of surgeries. I mentioned we have 6,600 surgeries per year. Uh, in children in particular, they tend to be very um, stochastic in nature. And so uh, um, using machine learning to predict surgery duration was our very first project. That project was very successful, uh, it worked very well. And so then that later led to a, a much bigger project about scheduling the operating room. So we found that, that it's useful to uh, start simple. You know, results in a hospital are judged by impact and not the sophistication of the methods you use. So we just started with something pretty simple where we could help them. And then I think another thing really important before any work begins, it's super important to discuss the project with just a really wide range of stakeholders. Oh, I see we've been upgraded and now include unlimited minutes. Um, so really wide range of stakeholders, um, groups you might not think about. So like human resources, people who work in process improvement, the hospital's IT services. So very important to, um, involve a wide range of people. For example, hospital leaders can tell you what the institutional priorities are and staff can tell you about constraints that are the practical constraints. So very important to work with a wide range of stakeholders. So I will say in the stakeholder buy-in step one, we've not really experienced failures, be, but just because um, we, we've already got our system set up with our person who works at the hospital. But anyway, so that's step one. Now let's talk about step two, three, and four. And there we have had some successes and some failures. Uh, so step two, solving the technical problem. So unfortunately, some projects you think at first are feasible, they later turn out to be infeasible. So uh, one of our projects was about identifying patients at risk of clinical decline. So a patient's in the hospital and they're hooked up to machines that provide all kinds of continuous information. It looks like in this particular um, uh, display here, the top one is the person's pulse. The second one and third one somehow are relating to blood pressure. Uh, probably this one that says 95 is oxygen saturation. Anyway, we have all kinds of information real time about a patient. And so the idea, and this project was spearheaded by my colleague, Nick Bombos, who's a professor of electrical engineering. And the idea was maybe if we have this waveform data, we could predict clinical decline. That is, we could predict that a patient needs help before you know code red happens and everyone has to rush in and try to save the patient. Um, and clinical decline is some kind of crisis event, like the person suddenly can't breathe or whatever. So, um, so that was our idea. So we have a lot of data. We have data, 125 samples per second. So very dense waveform data. We have data from 38,000 patients over about a decade. So that is 35 terabytes of data. And I don't know what exactly that is, but that is 
a massive, massive, massive amount of data. So uh, that's the first challenge. What are you going to do with all this data? But there are other challenges. First of all, uh, the crisis events are actually rare events. Second, there's lots of gaps and noise in the data. So here's some um, looks like electrocardiogram data and uh, respiration. I don't know what this middle one is, but for this patient, we have some, some data and then we have some blanks. And so you're trying to predict things and there's gaps and noise in the data. And as I mentioned, there are massive amounts of data. So in starting to uh, try to work on this project, which was actually spearheaded by a PhD student, we realized that in fact, it was infeasible. There was no way we could do this. And so what the, the team did is they came up with a new goal to improve the data. Okay, the data has gaps. We can't use it. Maybe we can improve it. So what they did is they developed a model to reconstruct the missing data. Uh, so here's an, a picture of like imputing imputed data, what might have been in there. And then um, to analyze and extract information from arbitrary waveforms. So we pivoted to do this. And in order, I'll just spend one slide on the technical detail. Uh, what the student did is this super fancy machine learning method, which I did not do and do not fully understand, but it's called a convolutional autoencoder. And the basic idea is they took samples from 138 patients, um, electrocardiogram and respiratory data, they did waveform processing to create convolutional layers, uh, then created compression layers, which is the encoded hidden state, and then reconstruct by decompressing and deconvolving. Uh, so a, a super fancy machine learning type of method. Um, but again, the idea is just to reconstruct the data. It's not the original project goal. So I have a little scorecard here technical solution implemented or sustained. So this one, it failed on the original technical solution. Uh, if you're interested, the work has been published in a, in a conference. So now here's a project where the technical solution actually did succeed. Uh, so I mentioned about monitoring and reducing the bloodstream infections or so-called collapses. So our goal was to uh, predict collapses from patient data. So here's a person, they have central line um, at, uh, in their neck where drugs and other things are going to um, be in, in their jugular vein, where drugs are going to be um, given to them. Uh, you have to sometimes insert things there like uh, drugs, et cetera, and infection can happen. So that's a bad thing. So we'd like to avoid that. So at our hospital, we'd like to understand and avoid that. So the problem, so we wanna predict when this will occur, but the problem is these are rare, uh, not that common. And so again, we, we had a new goal, which was to analyze the clinical practices reflected in the data. So um, it turns out that uh, there's, there's uh, guidelines for how the physician or the nurse should um, give a patient medication or fluids or whatever is needed. For some types of things, you should use the central line, the thing that's in the neck. For some things, you should use the peripheral line that's in, usually in someone's wrist. And for some, they're preferred, but some you should only use the central line. So there are access guidelines. So what our students did is they looked at three years of data on central line access and they categorized whether the access was appropriate. That's all. So we have data in the electronic health record that says I access the central line. And we have data in the electronic health record that says, and here's what I did. So the students looked at, was it appropriate? That's all, super simple, no analytics. And they found that half of all the access was actually not following the guidelines. Um, and our hospital leadership didn't know about this. So in fact, the clinicians were super enthusiastic that if we could just try to follow the guidelines better, we could probably help prevent these infections. So, um, so that was step one. And then step two, what we've done is created actually a dashboard for the different 
uh, different um, uh, departments showing uh, what is the compliance with these guidelines. And so we are now using this dashboard to monitor and reduce our bloodstream infections. Uh, so I would say in this one, we did solve the technical problem. Um, and I don't think we have a publication yet describing that. So solving the technical problem, sometimes we had to pivot. Implementation. So the next thing is you, you've got this great idea. Uh, is it going to, and, and a solution, is it going to be implemented? And as I mentioned, many healthcare hospital operations projects are never implemented. Uh, you know, they may make too many simplifying assumptions. They might not incorporate practical constraints. They might require infrastructure or expertise that's just not available at the hospital. So I'm going to talk about. Um, a project that was not implemented and a project that uh, was implemented. So I mentioned that we were working on a number of projects in the operating room. And one of the projects was to schedule surgical procedures. And in particular, uh, after patients leave the operating room, they usually go to the post anesthesia care unit. Well, when you think about surgeries, you need to think about how much time will this child need in the post anesthesia care unit. It turned out that our post anesthesia care unit uh, had a lot of congestion, but if you could maybe schedule the procedures better, you could even out the requirements for the post anesthesia care unit. We actually at our hospital had the problem of the patient actually had to stay on the operating table for an hour or more until a bed opened up in the post anesthesia care unit. So super expensive uh, use of idle time in a very expensive operating room. So to solve this problem, my student, Michael, I mentioned uh, we, we use some machine learning. In this case, he used machine learning to estimate for each type of procedure and each child how long the recovery time would be. Then he used integer programming to schedule procedures and then simulation to show that in fact, it was a really good thing. So um, he used machine learning to predict how long the recovery would be. It turned out it was moderately accurate. It, it turned out that it uh, depended a lot on what type of procedure, of course, but also on the patient's weight and age, um, and then a variety of other factors. So that was step one. Step two, was scheduling surgical procedures. So he used two sequential integer programs. The first one, he said, why don't I just put all the, the surgeries in each operating room as needed to minimize the ending time? Then he's going to use these ending times as constraints in the second integer program, but allowing extra time. And now in the second integer program, will schedule procedures to minimize the maximum occupancy of the post anesthesia care unit. And by the way, this work is described in an, uh, an article in uh, healthcare management science, which tells all the details. Anyway, so used integer programming, and then he used simulation to show if you had used my method, here much, here's how much better you could be. So this is just a graph of occupancy of the post anesthesia care unit. There's uh, basically 12 beds or essentially, um, and how many hours at each level of occupancy. Uh, so this is what happened historically. If we would uh, use our, our method with the estimated recovery times, we kind of shift this curve less left. So there's less occupancy. And then if we actually had clairvoyance, we knew how long it would take to recover, we could shift the curves left further. That's just a high overview, basically saying the method worked. Um, so the optimized schedule had the same operating room utilization, but we reduced holds by 76%. So you say to me, Margaret, that's really amazing. You know, your student uh, did this project and it worked and it's good. But I, I told you the preview, which was this was not implemented. So why is that? We worked with hospital leaders, we had stakeholder buy-in, we solved exactly the problem you know, we did all the right things, so why wasn't it implemented? Well, the reason is 
the way the schedule works is the IT department finds out what, what is needed, uh, the surgeries for tomorrow or the next day, and uploads the data. Then the scheduling nurse would use the integer program to figure out, oh, okay, here's, you know, it's, it's on a little laptop. Here's what, what, what happened. But then sometimes you have to make changes. And so this would have to go back to the IT department. And it turns out that this was quite time consuming. It was not a seamless process. It involved a person in the middle. So in fact, this project was not yet implemented. It also happened that at the exact same time we were um, renovating our hospital and our operating room. So um, we just kind of put this one on pause. So maybe one day it will be implemented, but I have to confess that so far it's not a success, except it's a nice paper. Uh, so not implemented. And as I mentioned, um, it, uh, Michael, my student, published this work in healthcare management science. Okay, now a project that was implemented, infusion center scheduling. So we have seven infusion chairs slash beds. And the goal is to create a system to maximize the utilization of these beds. Um, well, the thing is, we have two kinds of demand. We have scheduled demand you know about, but we also have walk-in where maybe a doctor says, look, this kid needs to you know, get this infusion now. So we've got to accommodate both types of demand and we'd like to do it in a way that minimizes waiting times. So our student, Allison, what she did is she developed an optimization model to maximize utilization. But that was pretty fancy. And, and she thought that's just a little more than we need for our se seven beds. And, and the hospital people thought so as well. So maybe we could just come up with a near optimal heuristic. So, that, so that's what she did. And then uh, a simulation model to show that the heuristic was good and maybe to revise it as needed. So basically she started with optimization and then made, made a heuristic and uh, then simulated to show that in fact, um, we're doing a really good job. And this is by hour of day during peak times, we're doing a really good job of utilizing the bids. Um, so the, in fact, this was implemented. This is for the seven beds showing different patients in there. Uh, so the way it's implemented, we have, we formalized the instructions. So the nurse schedulers had our heuristic. We created a paper-based flow diagram of how you use the heuristic. And so in fact, this is being used. And now we're, we're monitoring improvements in the schedule to see how good it has been. So, uh, and then providing feedback and training to the schedulers. So this was a success. It was, we solved the technical problem and it was implemented. And this is currently a working paper that's not yet been published. So uh, the last part of success, as I mentioned, is sustained use. Okay, so it's implemented. Is it sustained? So uh, again, I'm going to talk about a project that didn't work and a project that did work. So sustained use, the first one, predicting surgical case length. I mentioned this was our very first project. So the idea the way it worked at our hospital originally is the procedures, how long a procedure would take, the surgeon would just say, well, you know, I've got to operate on this child, uh, 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 removing the spleen tomorrow morning. And I, I think it will take, you know, two and a half hours or whatever. Uh, and we asked them, well, how do you, uh, how do you estimate this? So this is what they sent us back. Indiana Jones with his crystal ball. That's how we estimate this, the procedures length. And so what we decided to do was um, to uh, do something a little more formal. And we looked at some machine learning models. We looked at decision trees, random forests, et cetera. And we also looked at machine learning models with and without the surgeon's procedure length estimate. This is just a picture from the paper showing for the different machine learning models, decision tree, random forest gradient boosting. Uh, with and without the surgical, the, the, the estimate from the, uh, uh, the surgeon, uh, the prediction accuracy. Uh, it turned out the best method was random forest, pretty reasonable. So we found out that the surgeon's estimate was pretty good. That was the most important factor. But there were also other factors, as you might imagine, the surgeon. Some people might overestimate, some might underestimate type of procedure, weight of and age of child were also kind of important. 
Anyway, so we solved this problem. Uh, it was implemented, and the way it was implemented is that uh, the uh, we first just kept the surgeons um, estimating the procedure lengths like they did. But we we had uh, actually some of our students started a company to do the machine learning and send automated forecasts back uh, from the machine learning. And so if the machine learning forecast differed rather significantly from what the surgeons said, then an email alert would be sent. Or actually, I think it might have been a text message. Yeah, text message. Um, then you'd review the forecast manually and decide what you wanted to do and then adjust the schedule manually. But the problems here is that, again, a lot of effort was required on the part of people to get in the middle of this loop. So, and many alerts were for short cases, like you don't care if it's 50, uh, an hour versus 45 minutes, it probably doesn't matter. Um, you know, we're talking about small differences in time. Um, so in fact, the implementation of this has not been sustained. Um, the technical uh, work describing it is described in this paper. Anyway, again, we may go back to this eventually. We, we have a solution. We just have to figure out how to make it sustain. A project that was sustained is about managing surgical supplies. So I mentioned that when surgery happens, a supply cart is wheeled in. And the supply cart has whatever supplies are needed for that surgery. Uh, these what's needed for the surgery is given on preference cards. Uh, I'm removing the spleen of a child using laparoscopic surgery. Actually, my niece had that <laughs> procedure done. That's how I know. But anyway, I'm, I'm doing this. And so a cart, uh, a preference card for that surgery will be given. You, here's the supplies you need. And somebody will put all these things on a cart and wheel it into the room. Um, cards are not always accurate. So if you don't have the right thing you need, there's surgical delays. Uh, somebody has to run out and go get the stuff out of the supply room. Of course, if you have too much things you don't need, you waste supplies. And sometimes uh, maybe uh, you have to throw supplies in just at the last minute and they're never even built for. So there, there, there can be a lot of waste and confusion and delays associated with inaccurate cards. So what our students did is they did an inventory analysis using the electronic health record. And what they did is they, they looked to find out which necessary items, ones that were actually used, were missing from the preference cards and which unnecessary items were included on the preference cards. So then they created a fully driven tool using the electronic health record. So this would be like an electronic preference card. This is not from our hospital, it's just generic, but you know, someone's gonna have a colonoscopy, uh, you know, and, and here's the things that are needed. So we made this fully driven tool where the automated preference card pops up and the nurses can accept, reject or modify changes to these preference cards. So it, you, you can still change if you wish. Then we did a case controlled study. So we implemented the system and then we said, okay, did, did this help? And in fact, we found out that there were seven items added on average and five items removed per card on average compared to what we had been doing. And that we actually experienced significant cost savings. So this is a project that achieves sustained use and where we measured the use. So that was really good. Um, so this was an example of a project where all three goals were achieved or goals two, three, and four. Uh, and this was recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association. So I've talked about a broad range of projects. Let me now talk about some of the lessons that summarize some of the lessons we've learned. So step one, achieving stakeholder buy-in. I mentioned we have to have a committed partner from the hospital. We really have to have ongoing communication. And, and again, pivot if the project's not working. Uh, so those are kind of, uh, some of the lessons. And then, as I also mentioned, I think starting with a modest, small project is often a great way to get people excited. That's how we've done it. And we actually have people now just knocking on our door saying, please help me with this project. 
I, I'm, you know, I'm an oncologist and I see this problem. Please help me. So that's good. Um, in solving the technical problem, as I mentioned, I think um, you certainly have to choose a model that you can actually solve that fits the problem in the data. You know, obtaining, I'm sure any of you who've tried to do anything with a hospital know obtaining needed data is always challenging. Uh, is it available? What's the quality? But, and so I mentioned about the hospital operating room scheduling project. It took my student at least a year of back and forth with hospital IT to get the data in a form he could use. Uh, well, for our projects on rare events, we, off, we found out that was kind of hard to do because they're orders of magnitude lower than we think. And then I mentioned again, as in my previous, you have to really be willing to pivot and change as needed. So for example, we focused on some of our projects on understanding and visualizing data rather than predicting. And sometimes more than one model is needed. Uh, sometimes it's useful to test multiple models and pick the best one. Okay, that's solving the technical problem. Implementation. Uh, I think before you even start work, it's really important to understand how you're thinking of implementing a model and make sure key staff members who use the model are gonna work with you. Um, important to choose the appropriate technical partners. You got the right people in the hospital to, to help you with this. Um, I think you may have noticed that the projects that worked like the, um, the preference cards or the uh, infusion center scheduling in, did not disrupt workflows. They didn't, it wasn't like the operating room scheduling project where somebody had to manually send stuff back to IT, et cetera. No workflow disruption is helpful. Of course, knowing the technical constraints of the hospital and what they can actually do is important. And then, as I mentioned, successful projects are often implemented in stages. Like you understand the data, you create a dashboard, then you optimize. Uh, finally, on sustaining, as I mentioned, partnerships essential at the very project start. Um, you've got to have projects that align with institutional priorities, you've got to have continual feedback, and you also have to have incentives so people are incentivized to use the, the solution you've provided. Um, we found that automated systems certainly have an advantage. I think particularly if people have the opportunity to override an automated solution. Um, we found that a one-time process redesign tends to be sustained. Um, if, if you're just gonna say, we're just gonna do this one thing and, and implement it and just redesign, that tends to be sustained because it's done. Um, and then I mentioned really important to be able to measure improvements generated by a project. It's all very nice to implement a new system, but if you didn't show it helped, then where are you? Um, so these are some high level lessons that we've learned. Some concluding thoughts. I think that there are many opportunities to improve healthcare value using analytical tools. And clearly that's what you all are certainly interested in. Um, so many opportunities. Uh, and, and you know, I think using the tools that we have in our toolkit as operations researchers, we can we have huge opportunities to improve decisions about the design and delivery of healthcare. You know, we can exploit available data, we can capture system complexities and optimize system performance. Those are just some of the things we can do. Um, but of course, as I've highlighted, it's really important that the tools be designed to achieve sustained value. Um, so the work I've just, the, the talk I've just presented is summarized in a paper that we published last year in the INFORMS Journal on Applied Analytics. And I have much more details there. But anyway, thank you so much for listening. And, uh, you know, I welcome your questions. And I see we have questions in the chat. So Safa, how would you like to do this? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brando, for this interesting, really interesting, inspiring talk. Uh, so uh, for the question, I will begin uh, FIFO. So the first uh, question was, uh, the question of Najla, I say, and um, can you tell us more about the work done on the prediction, on the prediction of surgery times and how uh, this is taken into account into uh, into consideration 
uh, in the operating scheduling. Yes. So the project I mentioned on operating room scheduling, I didn't mention when I talked, but we used the predicted surgical durations as input. So we used the, the surgical durations predicted from the machine learning method. And then for that project, we additionally predicted how long the recovery time would be. So we did use that. Uh, um, so we, we had already done that work and we had very nice predictions. So we're like, okay, we'll use that. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question, question was of uh, Sundus Hamami. And the question is, it's, uh, so our hospitals here in Tunisia uh, are a bit behind a bit behind the developed countries. So if we deal with the major problems of hospitals, it, could, it would be difficult to publish in impacted journals. Right. So uh, what we are doing, we are rehashing, I think, topics covered extensively in the literature. In other words, we define what problem you have to deal with to be able to publish. Because this is a problem of researchers everywhere, I think. Right. And uh, we try to convince some services or department or ministry of health, the interest of this problem, problem, problematic, and we collect data, develop approaches, publish, the main objective was reached, without implementation. So in the case of home care, there are not even regulations that allows the doctor to practice outside of hospitals. We have published on uh, home care, care, but I don't think any approach has been implemented. So we have uh, also a problem with ha ha having reliable uh, data. The first, the first thing to do is to set up systems to collect the data, but that takes time. And I think this is a, this is a kind of um, uh, this is a reality here in Tunisia. But I think that the, uh, uh, <laughs> should go over and uh, um, and seek for implementation. I think I don't know if uh, Professor Brand, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, I think the difficulties you you uh, describe are pretty common, right? Yeah. Um, like you, you can see what the problem is. Maybe someone else has solved the problem, but at least you can see that th there's a problem that you could solve. I mean, I have uh, talked about how we publish papers on some of these projects, but in fact, you know, it, I don't think publication is always your goal sometimes, and sometimes even implementation, you can't necessarily get there. You just have to start with what you have and maybe eventually implementation will happen. Um, and I see there's a question, what are the most important phases yeah. to allocate more time to? Define the problem or solve it? In my opinion, yeah. the most important thing is to define a good problem that you can solve really to define the problem. And I, I'm a very firm believer in start small. Maybe in, in a project, you could just start on something super simple. And, and, and I agree completely about the data. So you don't always have the data. So maybe uh, one could think about how could I allocate the beds in this one hospital ward? I think I mentioned that one of our things was a heuristic on a piece of paper, you know, it's not necessarily rocket science, but they implemented it and they improved. So, um, proposing, I, yeah, the adequate, perhaps the adequate solution, the adequate uh, or the accurate solution that will be adopted by the users themselves. But it, again, it depends on what your goal is, of course. If you're a PhD student, you or a master's in public health student, you may want to get a paper out of a publication. And, and I mean, my students want yeah. to get publications uh, We too, have so. another question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question from Safa Shabouh. 
The question is, the, the success of such projects depends on the collaboration and implication of healthcare partners, hospital managers, department heads, doctors, stakeholders. So in our case, it was difficult, especially uh, for having and collecting data. What could you suggest to encourage these stakeholders to participate and commit to our projects? Um, I think there's two things. It's a, it's a long process kind of. Uh, one thing which is super great is if you have a former student who goes to work at the hospital, um, that person will be very interested. So if you have anybody who, who works at the hospital who's agreeable to your techniques, that is certainly helpful uh, to, to have somebody within the hospital. But I think the other thing is... Um, to just do something simple and show that it's a good thing. You know, what I described today was a number of years of projects. It was not done in a week, right? We started just predicting surgical durations and then slowly we, we did other things. So I think you to get stakeholders involved, if you can do something simple first, just, you know, very easy, that's often, and, and show that it got made things better. That's often a way to get involvement. Um, that yeah. and planting your own spies, that is your former students. Uh, there's have there's no magic answer though, it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I, we have a question from uh, Munira Masmoudi, Dr. Masmoudi. And uh, can we have a copy of the presentation? This nice yes, presentation? Yes, and I will, Safa, after the, um, when I'm done, I will email you my slides and then you can, anyone who wants them, I guess, is that the best way? Or people could email me directly? Yeah. Yeah, Mornera, uh, you could just, anyone could email me directly if they want and I will reply with the slides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brando. It's very really kind. Or I, I, I will send you an email for the presentation and I will uh, forward it to the members. Uh, okay. If you, yeah. I'm happy to share. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a question. Dr. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Brando, if you have questions, can we ask, like, ask you directly via email? Of course. Thank you. Of course. So, Safel Kefi is um, uh, uh, a student from National Engineering School of Tunis and uh, right now, she is uh, at uh, Stevens Technology um, Institute of Technology. I'm, I'm at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken. Yeah. Cool. So in New I'm, York. Actually, I'm actually working on pretty similar problematics in healthcare. That's why I have like many questions to ask. I don't want to bother the others with all my questions now. That's why I asked <laughs> to ask you that. Thing. I, so you have a list course. of questions, Safa. Yeah, <laughs> it's written actually. <laughs> you can send me an email. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Safa. Uh, we have a question from Joe. So the implementation stage could require promotion in the context of making available all the required resources and continuous measurement of productivity and progress uh, monitoring. So the stage uh, could identify gaps and areas for review. So the, sta the sustainable use stage could entail adjustment. Uh, adjustment. I'm sorry. I lost the. I lost the question. One moment. So the the sustainable use stage could entail adjustments to correct the gaps and establish institutionalized or otherwise put in place systems for sustainable practice. I think it was about sustainability. Yeah, completely agree with what you said. Um, you, yeah. again, you have to still have buy-in where people say we're willing to, to test the system and see if it worked. Yeah. Yeah, and, completely agree. Yeah. Uh, and, question, and, and as you say, you might adjust your system yeah. based on that. I completely agree. So we view it as a continuous process. Yes. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, so if a project fails, how does the partner react <laughs> uh, <laughs> to solve the problem? <laughs> you know, 
You have to be a little bit philosophical. And also we, the analysts, can't overpromise. <laughs> you know, you can't say I'm going to solve all the problems that you've ever had. That's, you know, but maybe if you continuously work with them and you say, you know, that didn't work so well. Why don't we do something different? And, and how can we make something of value out of it? So I think you just have to be flexible and be willing to pivot as needed. And don't overpromise. <laughs> be, be realistic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a question from Safa. So are the projects you talk about in the beginning related or they are working on separately? So because some are uh, related um, in my opinion. Um, they, they were related in the sense that, for example, when we did the operating room scheduling, we used the, the, the results of the project on the, um, the, the prediction of surgical times. Um, they tend to be worked on separately because most of them have a different student working on it. But, you know, we share with each other what we're doing, but I would say they're loosely correlated. Uh, yeah. Uh, then the, the message war, uh, was, we're about thanking you very much. So thanks a lot. It was very interesting. <laughs> well, I think um, the questions are over here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everybody for listening. And um, thanks for your many interesting questions and comments. Yeah. It's really, yeah. it's really great to share with fellow enthusiasts for improving healthcare. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Brando uh for this uh inspiring actually inspiring talk so uh thank you for everyone for being uh, part of this uh, this talk and of this event uh i think that uh, we'll uh, move on to our uh, second speaker who is dr safa dr sana dr sana bye hello hello everyone Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Bonjour, yeah. tout le monde. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, Dr. Sanalaya is uh, actually a member of our working group. And uh, uh, is, uh, so, um, she is an architect, an architect, and a doctor affiliated to the research unit uh, on ambiences era. Uh, from the National School of Architecture uh, here in Tunisia. Uh, and she works on ident identifying uncomfortable and embracing situations in particular uh, with uh, autistic uh, children and uh, through uh, precisely through the capture of emotion and through the electrodermal activities. Uh, so we are very happy to have you, Dr. Sana, as member and uh, as uh, a speaker uh, in this seminar. So, uh, and uh, you, you, you will uh, gi uh, give your talk in French, yeah. so to have uh, the French talk and uh, an English talk in our seminar. And it would be um, Architecture pour la santé mentale, l'espace comme composante dans les soins de la santé. So Architecture for Healthcare for uh, mental health care and the space as uh, a component uh, for um, the health care or the health care uh, cares. <laughs> so uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Lai. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Safe. Um, so uh, I'll begin by um, sharing my screen. Um, as uh, Safa so introduced uh, the speech. My talk will be in uh, uh, in French, but I I try to have my slides in with the keywords in English. So um, I hope that it will be um, clear for uh, everyone uh, today. Uh, so. Um, I switch on uh, French. Uh, voilà, Sanel Raib, uh, architect uh, de l'École nationale d'architecture et d'urbanisme de Tunis. Um, uh, 
ce que je vais présenter aujourd'hui, c'est un peu la synthèse, euh, les résultats principaux de mon travail de thèse qui a euh, démarré euh, dans une collaboration euh, multidisciplinaire euh, entre euh, architectes, euh, ingénieurs de l'unité U2S euh, de l'INIT, euh, euh, avec le département génie euh, mécanique. Euh, C'est un travail qui a commencé, une, une collaboration multidisciplinaire qui a commencé avec mon travail de master sur précisément sur le stress sonore urbain dans la dans le centre ville de la centre ville de Tunis et cette collaboration s'est élargie avec de nouveaux partenaires notamment des pédopsychiatres de la faculté de médecine de Monastir et qui a donné lieu à différents types de données physiques euh, physiologique euh, parce que je travaille principalement sur euh, la capture de l'émotion ou euh, cette, euh, cette capture euh, de l'état émotionnel ou de l'état d'éveil euh, de la personne enquêtée, que ce soit dans l'espace urbain pour des personnes euh, neurotypiques et pour les enfants autistes pour euh, mon sujet de thèse. Donc j'avais des données physiologiques, euh, physiques et aussi euh, psychiatriques. Euh, donc, euh, principalement, mon intervention aujourd'hui, euh, elle est dans l'objectif justement de présenter toute cette base de données euh, qui peut servir, euh, qui est vraiment multidisciplinaire et qui peut servir euh, et enrichir les différents travaux de recherche dans euh, les différentes disciplines. Donc, euh, ces travaux qui étaient principalement, le, le travail de thèse puisque mon travail de master, a pu euh, d'abord euh, faire une assise pour quatre PAFA qui ont été soutenus euh, depuis 2014 euh, à l'ENIT euh, et, qui, et, et un, qui présentait un peu une assise, un ancrage un peu scientifique, une pré-enquête, un, un, des enquêtes préliminaires pour un peu voir le terrain et les potentialités euh, des objectifs qu'on avait euh, posés et aussi à, à alimenter aussi euh, euh, de sujets de, de master euh, en 2015 et en 2018. Le travail a été achevé en, pratiquement entre 2018 et 2019. Donc, euh, toute cette base de données a été bien évidemment euh, exploitée d'un point de vue euh, architectural, mais le terrain, il est encore présent pour euh, d'autres travaux de recherche. Euh, donc, pour re revenir un petit peu sur un peu le contexte de ce travail, euh, fin à l'autisme, euh, j'ai voulu commencer mon, mon intervention par présenter cette, euh, ce contexte euh, qui, au, le, par rapport au sujet de, de l'autisme, comme on peut voir sur euh, ce graphique. Euh, euh, donc, on peut voir que la prévalence un peu de, euh, des taux euh, de l'autisme ont augmenté à 100% entre 1975 et 2009. Euh, en 2009, des études montrent que euh, les chiffres de l'OMS parlaient de 1% de la population. Euh, les chiffres et les statistiques en Tunisie sont plus ou moins rares, mais les quelques euh, études et statistiques publiées par euh, Dr. Belhaj ou Dr. Gadour euh, parlaient un peu d'une incidence pas loin des 1% un peu du taux mondial. On est à peu près à 1 en Tunisie et à 1 cas pour 112 euh, euh, personne. Le problème par rapport à cette population, que la prise en charge, que ce soit pour le secteur privé ou le secteur public, ça reste toujours limité et le terrain, tout un, tra un, un travail des chantiers à faire euh, par rapport à, euh, à, à cette population. Donc, euh, commençons d'abord à comprendre un peu euh, euh, l'autisme. Qu'est-ce qui fait qu'un architecte s'intéresse euh, à l'autisme D'abord, il faut préciser, il faut préciser qu'il ne s'agit pas, euh, pas d'une maladie. Ça fait, là, c'est euh, Donc, il ne s'agit pas... Oui, ça fait, c'est bon. Oui, 
c'est bon. Donc, il ne s'agit pas d'une maladie. Je disais qu'il ne s'agit pas d'une maladie, mais plutôt d'un trouble de développement qui est caractérisé par une euh, triade de déficiences, c'est-à-dire trois caractéristiques principales. D'abord, euh, une déficience dans la communication verbale et non-verbale, euh, euh, des difficultés à soudre de relations sociales et euh, un manque d'imagination et d'intégration. Donc, l'enfant autiste, qu'on peut voir un peu dans ces, ces schématisations, il s'agit d'un enfant qui vit un peu en isolement dans sa bulle et, et, et tout le travail était justement de briser cette bulle et de faire euh, d'y rentrer ou de faire sortir de l'enfant euh, de son monde isolé. Donc, ce qui nous intéresse, euh, ce que m'intéresse moi, en tant, avec cette casquette d'architecte, c'est justement cette perception et comment et, et cet, espace, cet enfant vit l'espace. Parce que sa perception à l'espace, elle est différente de la nôtre. Donc, il voit, il, 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 il vit les choses, puisque voir, c'est percevoir, c'est-à-dire vivre, se déplacer avec les cinq sens. Et, et cette perception, cette, ce vécu, il est très différent de nous. C'est pour ça qu'on parle d'une perception altérée. Donc, les études euh, qui s'intéressaient un peu dans, de cette, euh, par rapport à cette interaction entre autisme et, et, et environnement euh, ont commencé à peu près au début du XXe siècle. Avec, euh, par, euh, ça a intéressé un peu les designers d'espace et certains euh, ergothérapeutes ou, ou, ou pédopsychiatres ou, euh, ou psychiatres. Donc, euh, donc euh, pour pour nous, tout, tout l'enjeu était justement de décrypter, de comprendre cette relation, euh, ces réactions de l'enfant qui sont généralement difficiles à gérer par rapport à la, surtout dans, dans la famille. Euh, donc, ces réactions de l'enfant dans un espace donné que nous avons choisi et limité pour euh, ce travail dans les établissements scolaire ou les centres d'apprentissage spécialisés. Et, et donc, on s'intéressait à cette relation, euh, ces réactions de l'enfant euh, aux différents stimuli euh, qui, qui sollicitent l'enfant en termes de lumière, en termes de couleur, en termes de son, ainsi de suite. Donc, euh, donc euh, les, les objectifs principaux euh, euh, de ce travail étaient justement de dépasser une approche purement normative, standardisée, euh, euh, vers une approche plutôt sensible, qualitative. Parce que généralement, ces centres d'éducation spécialisés euh, répondaient un peu aux cahiers de charge présentes pour euh, les jardins d'enfants, euh, pour euh, les établissements scolaires, c'est-à-dire tout était dans la norme. On s'intéresse à l'enfant en termes de euh, quantité de lumière par rapport à un plan de travail, superficie euh, par rapport à l'enfant, nombre d'enfants à peu près 1 mètre, 1 mètre 5 par enfant, c'est-à-dire un peu la capacité de centre, de, du centre à accueillir des enfants, euh, et surtout des raisons d'hygiène ou de sécurité en termes de... Euh, facile, on trouve des descriptions par rapport aux matériaux faciles à nettoyer, lisses, euh, qui ne présentent pas de danger, ainsi de suite, et on oublie dans tout ça l'importance des textures, l'importance des couleurs euh, dans la vie euh, d'un enfant en général, que dire euh, par rapport euh, à un enfant euh, avec autisme euh, qui a toute cette euh, hyper ou hypo, euh, hyper ou hyposensibilité, c'est-à-dire euh, ce qui est sûr, c'est qu'il y a une, une sensibilité différente et, sans, et un traitement différent de l'information euh, sensorielle. Euh, donc, euh, donc euh, le travail, il commence par euh, suite à la suite à, à, donc, euh, au signal, aux données physiologiques capturées par euh, ces montres connectées. Je vais en parler là tout de suite. Donc, on commence d'abord par une identification de situation euh, signifiante. Ambiental, je parle d'ambiental, c'est-à-dire spatial, des situations signifiantes, généralement stressantes. Parfois, on s'intéresse aussi à des situations euh, de euh, relaxation ou qui, qui présentent une, 
euh, un intérêt pour nous euh, architectes en termes spatiales. Euh, une fois ces, ces, ces situations sont identifiées, on cherchait après à les confronter, à comprendre un peu euh, les caractéristiques de l'espace euh, présente euh, liées à, cette, à, à une situation ou une réaction donnée. Et le but, bien sûr, ultime de travail, du travail était de pouvoir euh, corriger, euh, présenter des, des nouvelles recommandations, euh, proposer euh, de no des nouvelles dispositions dans l'espace ou des dispositifs qui peuvent remédier à ces situations euh, stressantes. Euh, euh, donc, euh, euh, donc, vous avez compris que c'est très complexe euh, comme, euh, comme démarche, donc euh, ça demandait forcément l'apport euh, interdisciplinaire, voire transdisciplinaire. Donc, euh, c'était une collaboration, comme je viens de présenter, entre l'École nationale d'architecture et d'urbanisme, U2S, actuellement L3S, le laboratoire L3S de l'ENIT, et, euh, et, et, et la faculté de médecine de Monastir. Donc, euh, d'abord, on commence par une enquête euh, graphique spatiale, une analyse des relevés, un état des lieux, euh, des, des espaces euh, occupés. Euh, puis, euh, d'une façon simultanée, on était à la, à, la, à la requête, on était en train de saisir, de capturer euh, le vécu à travers, euh, donc, euh, juste pour avoir mon pointeur, voilà, donc, euh, donc on captait euh, l'état émotionnel, l'état d'éveil de la personne, de cet enfant en euh, côté à travers des montres connectées et parallèlement, on faisait euh, simultanément euh, aussi la saisie, euh, la saisie des niveaux sonores et, et des enregistrements sonores et vidéo euh, de toute la scène, ou de, de tout le parcours euh, euh, traversé. Donc, ces montres connectées, ils présentent, euh, euh, ils présentent une, une vraie avancée euh, qui a marqué les années 2000 euh, avec les travaux de l'équipe Media Lab du MIT et, et, et qui, qui permettent d'évaluer de façon euh, objective, euh, ça permet d'évaluer, de capturer et en temps réel, euh, l'état d'éveil de, de la personne à travers la conductance de, de sa peau. C'est ce qui a fait un, le, le côté novateur ou innovant dans, dans toute euh, ma démarche. Donc, euh, en plus de la réaction électrodermale, euh, ces capteurs permettent aussi de, de mesurer les, la température, l'accélération, euh, le, le rythme cardiaque, ainsi de suite, mais pour nous, on s'intéressait spécialement à l'activité électrodermale ou euh, électrodermal activity EDA ou EA2, euh, EAD. Euh, euh, donc, euh, ces montres, ils permettent, euh, comme on peut suivre le signal avec euh, des applications mobiles en temps réel, on peut aussi euh, récupérer euh, les données euh, sous forme de tableau Excel où on peut après avoir cette courbe euh, euh, la courbe de données qu'on peut après analyser et traiter. Donc, généralement, pour résumer en deux mots, euh, ce signal électrodermal, euh, il, il, il augmente pendant des, émo des états émotionnels, euh, pendant des activités physiques ou même cognitives. Et euh, généralement, ça se stabilise dans des états de relaxation, de calme, euh, de non-gêne, de well-being, de bien-être, ainsi de suite. Euh, parallèlement à ceci, on, on devait aussi euh, confronter euh, ces données euh, physiologiques à d'autres données euh, 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 psychologiques, si vous voulez, euh, à travers des questionnaires. Et c'est un outil purement euh, psychiatrique euh, que nous avons. Que nous avons. Que nous avons. Je ne sais pas si tu as un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si tu as un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si tu as un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si tu as un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si tu as un peu de temps. Je ne s
يكلمه يكلمه خلوا له سو اوكي اتس اوكي سو دونك سي تان كيستيونير سا سافيل لو موديل دو دان ولو موديل دو سانسول بروفايل لو بروفيل سانسوريل دو لانفون سي تان كيستيونير ادريسي جينيرالمون او باران ou euh, à l'éducateur, la personne qui suit l'enfant de très près et, et, qui, et, et, et qui, ce questionnaire peut nous donner une idée, euh, enfin donner une idée, mais il peut euh, 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 nous aider à comprendre le modèle, euh, le comportement euh, de l'enfant envers les situations. Donc on, comme on peut le voir, euh, il s'agit, ça ça classifie un petit peu où on peut comprendre euh, selon un quadrant. Euh, en, euh, le RG, c'est des, c'est des enfants enregistreurs, euh, spectateurs, euh, seekers, c'est des chercheurs sensoriels, c'est des, des hyposensibles, donc ils sont toujours à la recherche du stimulus. Les avoiders, c'est-à-dire les euh, évitateurs, les SN, les sensibles, les hypersensibles. Pourquoi ce choix euh, de ce questionnaire Justement, parce que euh, ça bloque pour moi. Hmm. Mes slides euh, ne marchent plus. Je comprends pas. Suivant. Euh, je vais reprendre le partage du... Parce que là, ça bloque. Je, je... J'ai pas compris pourquoi. Voilà. Donc, euh, pour revenir un petit peu pourquoi à ce choix, c'est-à-dire que euh, euh, ça nous aide un petit peu à comprendre le the baseline ou un peu euh, le modèle comportemental de l'enfant, parce que ces, ces, ces réactions, cette classification, elle est derrière liée à des seuils neurologiques, euh, c'est-à-dire qu'on peut ça, ça a toujours un lien, ce modèle comportemental a un lien neurologique et par suite ce qui peut induire ou infléchir les réactions électrodermales, les réactions euh, psychophysiologiques. Donc c'est, c'est dans, dans cette corrélation que, qu'on, qu'on pouvait parfois trancher sur euh, certaines situations, comprendre certains comportements, euh, ainsi de suite. Donc euh, notre travail a été mené euh, dans trois centres euh, tunisien différent. Le premier était à Tastour. Euh, il s'agit d'un, d'un centre d'éducation spécialisé euh, qui était construit et destiné pour accueillir des, 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 des populations avec handicap, disons, y compris l'autisme, des sourds, ainsi de suite. Et deux autres centres euh, à Monastir et à Sousse, et ils font partie d'un réseau de centres d'éducation spécialisés, euh, qui est les centres Les Colombes. C'était grâce à notre collaboration avec euh, le laboratoire euh, euh, Viscose et Vulnérabilité, vulnérabilité euh, attaché à la faculté de médecine de euh, Monastir. Donc, euh, l'étude a porté sur 27 euh, enfants âgés entre 4 et 14 ans. Et le but était de les suivre dans un parcours journalier, c'est-à-dire depuis leur arrivée au centre jusqu'à leur départ, c'était à peu près entre 8h et 14h. Et ça résumait un peu un parcours journalier type où l'enfant reçoit des, 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 des activités pédagogiques, des activités de psychomotricité, des, des motricité fine, euh, des, des, des séances de motricité, c'est-à-dire des séances de sport, euh, euh, des séances d'orthophonie, il peut aller à la cantine, il prend son goûter, il peut sortir pour jouer, jouer dehors, euh, il prend l'escalier, euh, c'est-à-dire c'est un, on n'intervient pas sur le parcours, on laisse l'enfant euh, faire ses activités, son intervention et on le suit avec euh, tout... Euh, toute la démarche ou le protocole un peu expérimental que j'avais euh, expliqué. Donc, euh, une fois terminé, pour euh, pouvoir euh, justement un peu la démarche euh, analytique, donc on commence d'abord par un pré-traitement de signal pour, euh, pour nettoyer, pour, euh, pour enlever 
tout ce qui est artefacts de mouvement qui peut être lié à, à, aux conditions du port euh, du capteur. Puis, euh, on a essayé à faire une, une segmentation selon l'axe temps euh, euh, des différentes séquences traversées, c'est-à-dire les espaces. Par exemple, ici, on peut voir un peu la couleur rouge liée à les salles de classe, le bleu, la salle de sport, euh, le jaune, les espaces de transition, et c'est tout ce qui est escalier, couloir, transition verticale, c'est-à-dire escalier, et transition horizontale, les couloirs, les corridors, euh, euh, ainsi de suite. Euh, on faisait aussi, dans certaines situations, des corrélations ou des mises en correspondance des données, euh, surtout puisqu'on avait les données euh, audio, donc on faisait une correspondance entre... Euh, le signal physiologique et le spectrogramme audio. Et à la fin, pour pouvoir à la fin identifier, euh, identifier euh, les situations euh, spatiales. J'ai besoin de dire ambiental puisque le travail a été mené dans une équipe de recherche sur les ambiances. Donc, en biotale, qu'est-ce qu'on veut dire par ambiance, c'est-à-dire atmosphérique liée à la qualité de l'espace. Euh, donc, on a pu à la fin euh, faire une classification de ces, euh, de ces situations. Euh, donc, on avait des situations liées aux conditions visuelles, c'est-à-dire liées à la complexité visuelle de l'espace, un peu comme on peut, on peut voir sur euh, la photo. Je reprends avec mon laser euh, un peu sur euh, la photo, c'est-à-dire ce degré, la complexité, est-ce qu'il y a des motifs, est-ce qu'il y a euh, beaucoup de couleurs, est-ce qu'il y a beaucoup de lumière, ainsi de suite. Donc, c'est des situations, des configurations euh, liées à des con à conditions de vue. Des situations sonores, euh, on avait remarqué, par exemple, qu'il y, qu y avait certains euh, signaux qui viennent de l'extérieur. Par exemple, c'était dans le cas euh, du centre de Pestour, qui était juste à, à proximité d'un lycée. Donc, toutes les heures, il y avait cette sonnerie. Euh, donc, euh, on avait remarqué l'effet, justement, de ce stimulus ponctuel euh, sur des réactions électrodermales. Euh, certaines aussi euh, signaux, tels que, par exemple, la sonnerie ou une alarme, euh, la micro honte euh, pendant les, les, états, les, 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 les moments de repas. Donc, on voyait ça, on voyait cette réaction par rapport à ce stimulus pas ponctuel et on voit la réaction, le signal qui est augmenté et qui descendait juste les trois secondes qui suivaient un peu euh, euh, le déclenchement du sang. Il y avait des situations aussi liées, euh, c'est des situations kinesthésiques, c'est-à-dire liées à la mobilité, à la tenue, à la position du corps euh, de l'enfant. Et il y avait aussi des situations combiné ou euh, c'est-à-dire lié à plusieurs facteurs euh, en même temps. Donc, euh, 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 vu que l'objectif de travail était justement de donner des solutions, d'aider ces centres, euh, les éducateurs, les spécialistes, euh, les parents aussi, à, 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 à remédier architecturalement à, à ces situations. Donc, on avait des proposé à avoir euh, pour certains enfants à avoir cette euh, euh, des niches euh, des, des tapis roulants des petits coins d'isolement de, de petits coins où on peut partager où on peut être isolé et pour par euh, aussi par différentes textures par différentes couleurs et qui ou, ou l'espace où l'enfant il peut partager comme il peut être euh, en isolement euh, il peut certains enfants ont besoin d'être toujours euh, couverts ils, ils ont besoin toujours d'être en contact donc on proposait des choses euh, de, de qui peuvent favoriser justement ce besoin sensoriel euh, différentes textures dans un même espace Penser à introduire les différents matériaux, euh, bois, terre, eau, végétation, ainsi de suite. Euh, donc, c'est des situations contrastées, mais en même temps qui peuvent accueillir et répondre à ces besoins très différents de ces enfants. Travailler avec un enfant autiste, ça reste toujours un cas unique. Et ce qu'on cherchait justement de pouvoir généraliser, on va voir après 
qu'est-ce qu'on proposait comme solution pour pouvoir répondre à toute cette panoplie, à ces, à ces besoins parfois paradoxaux euh, euh, de ces enfants. Par rapport à, à tout ce qui est clairement, donc on proposait plutôt et on opte euh, plutôt pour des éclairements indirects ou ce qu'on appelle un éclairage zénital, euh, un éclairement par la toiture, une lumière indirecte qui évite un peu les taches euh, de soleil sur les plans de travail euh, des enfants. Et d'ailleurs, c'est des solutions qui peuvent aussi bien euh, répondre aux besoins, aux besoins des enfants avec troubles euh, autistiques, aussi bien aussi pour euh, les enfants neurotypiques. Euh, euh, pour les situations sonores, euh, l'architecte ne peut en aucun cas empêcher un véhicule de passer ou un, à une sonnerie de, de, de téléphone à se déclencher, en alarme ou un peu importe, mais l'architecte, il peut euh, réfléchir sur ses orientations, il peut réfléchir sur son implantation, euh, l'implantation de son projet, il, il doit réfléchir ses enveloppes, il doit réfléchir à, à la qualité de son, ses enveloppes en termes de filtrage, en termes d'isolation, et aussi parmi les configurations qui peuvent favoriser euh, euh, ces solutions, c'est justement euh, la configuration introvertue, euh, introvertie, c'est-à-dire une typologie introvertie, et qui nous renvoie un petit peu euh, à notre culture. C'est quelque chose qui nous ressemble, nous, en termes tunisiens, sur le bassin méditerranéen. C'est le patio. Euh, généralement, en dialecte tunisien, on parle de maison arabe, mais le patio, il n'est pas arabe, il est méditerranéen, il est mésopotamien. Euh, donc, cette configuration introvertie, elle, elle, elle nous protège euh, des nuisances de l'extérieur, mais ça fait un espace euh, qui favorise euh, euh, l'usage de la végétation, l'éclairage. C'est un dedans, c'est-à-dire c'est un intérieur mis qui s'ouvre sur l'extérieur. Euh, ça favorise euh, la présence de la végétation. Euh, ça favorise... Euh, la diversité des matériaux, on peut avoir des fontaines, on peut avoir du sable. Donc, ça peut résoudre pas mal de problèmes et ça peut donner de la qualité, de la qualité spatiale sans pour autant, avoir, sans pour autant demander un budget supplémentaire pour traiter ou couvrir des murs, ainsi de suite. Nous avons aussi remarqué euh, que l'ouverture vers l'extérieur présentait une échappatoire pour ces enfants. Euh, donc, on peut, même si on ne si peut pas euh, parfois ouvrir totalement, mais on peut ouvrir euh, euh, partiellement. Et, et, et contrairement à l'état de l'art, est, finalement, c'est tout, tout est travail d'enveloppe, tout est travail de limite, que ce soit au projet lui-même ou euh, dans les différents sous espaces. Donc, tout est travail euh, de limite et contrairement à l'état de l'art où on peut et qui est très euh, standard, quantitatif dans ses descriptions, euh, on a trouvé des choses euh, telles que conseiller les, les, les ouvertures hautes euh, pour, euh, pour éviter... Euh, que les enfants échappent, euh, fermés euh, pour ne pas disturber, euh, pour ne pas nuire, alors que ces extérieurs euh, présentaient une échappatoire émotionnelle pour certains enfants, surtout, que, surtout pour la, la catégorie que je viens de présenter, les SN, les, sens, les sensibles, les hypersensoriels. Donc, c'était une échappatoire à trouver euh, d'autres atmosphères et, et ça peut calmer. On a vu à chaque fois que l'enfant est en contact avec l'extérieur, avec une fenêtre qui s'ouvre vers l'extérieur, et on voyait que la courbe, vraiment, elle diminue considérablement. Euh, donc, euh, donc euh, finalement, cette singularité de l'autisme euh, envers une diversité euh, des besoins sensoriels euh, de ces enfants nous, nous pousse à à réfléchir à une architecture plutôt incrémentale, c'est-à-dire modulaire, modifiable, incrémentale, où on peut incrémenter, on peut modifier, euh, euh, que ce soit l'enfant, il peut modifier son espace ou à travers une, ou à travers une, ou c'est l'éducateur, la personne 
euh, qui suit l'enfant, il peut modifier l'espace selon son état émotionnel euh, ou aussi selon une approche inclusive qui va le préparer euh, petit à petit à une, à une inclusion sociale qui va le préparer à une école, à un espace qui peut correspondre à tous et on a dans notre dans un peu les paradigmes de l'architecture ce qu'on appelle les, les open schools ou les, les open air schools c'est à dire les écoles à ciel ouvert euh, les écoles jardins euh, ou, ou par exemple une euh, la fermeture n'est n'est pas c'est tout est éphémère tout est modulable tout est flexible tout tout est, euh, est tout c'est tout est malliable dans cet espace et c'est qui peut correspondre aux différents besoins sensoriels de ces enfants. Voilà. Euh, donc, pour terminer, je, je reviens un peu sur la première diapo. Euh, 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 J'ai mis, par exemple, parlé des deux masters euh, euh, où mon travail de thèse a pu alimenter ces, ces masters, c'est-à-dire la base de données que j'avais. Par exemple, ces, ces données euh, euh, physiologiques, c'est-à-dire l'activité électrodermale, et cette classification finalement des enfants, on a essayé de, de chercher grâce au, de faire une correspondance entre le profil sensoriel et le signal physiologique. Et on a essayé, sans passer par le profil sensoriel, est-ce qu'on peut avoir... Euh, est-ce qu'il y a une empreinte, une identité euh, du profil sensoriel sur, la, sur, la, euh, sur le signal électrodermal Donc, il y avait certaines pistes. Ces données ont, ont fait l'assise, ont alimenté, et ainsi de suite. Il y avait quelques tentatives, euh, mais j'en suis sûre que c'est vraiment une mine de données. Peut-être ça... Dépasse parce que là, moi, en tant qu'architecte, je m'intéresse à l'espace et ses qualités plus qu'au traitement proprement dit des signaux. Donc, euh, voilà, j'espère euh, par cette intervention, euh, j'ai pu expliquer un peu les potentialités que peut ce travail euh, euh, présenter. Euh, j'espère aussi que c'était clair. Je sais que c'est un peu le jargon, un peu... Je suis un peu loin de, de votre spécialité, mais je sais que la collaboration, elle peut être euh, faite et des nouvelles euh, pistes promoteuses euh, sont à l'horizon, j'espère. Voilà. Euh, voilà, merci beaucoup. J'espère que je n'étais pas trop longue euh, et claire. J'espère que j'étais claire. Et voilà, merci à vous tous. Et voilà, à vous, Madame Parfait. Euh, voilà. Merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup, Sana, pour euh, la présentation. Oui, euh, ben, je, je suis désolée, j'ai eu un, un souci avec euh, la caméra de mon PC. C'est pour ça que <rire> je suis sur deux comptes, une par vidéo et une par, euh, par son. So, uh, thank you very much. Et euh, finalement, on a eu des questions euh, euh, dans la discussion. Euh, donc, Sandus euh, Hamemi, je pense, euh, va se charger de les lire et de les poser. Ok, merci. Ok, merci, ça fait. Merci, Sana, pour cette présentation très pédagogue. C'est très enrichissant. Donc, euh, je passe directement aux questions. Donc, euh, je commence par la dernière question, contrairement à ça fait. Donc, c'est une question par, posée par Madame Meji. Le système en tant que cadre peut-il être élargi pour inclure plus d'options, telles que d'autres dispositifs physiologiques et d'autres modalités pour, capti, pour capturer la parole, les postures et l'expression faciale des enfants afin de surveiller de manière appropriée leur état émotionnel Voilà. Voilà. Um... Euh, oui, euh, euh, comme je viens d'expliquer, le travail, c'est-à-dire la rédaction, la soutenance, c'était achevé entre 2018-2019 euh, et tout le travail sur terrain est arrêté pratiquement en 2017. Euh, en, pendant ce moment-là, il n'y avait pas des études très poussées par rapport à cette reconnaissance faciale ou une reconnaissance émotionnelle par rapport à des caméras. Je pense que maintenant, euh, les mêmes, la, la même compagnie, elle travaille 
travaille sur ceci et je pense que, euh, que le travail peut être élargi euh, dans ce sens. Pour mon travail, pour mon cas, pour justement remédier à ce manque qui peut être euh, intéressant, euh, on a opté pour les enregistrements vidéo. Et il y avait toute une démarche d'intégration progressive, c'est-à-dire une immersion finalement des relations humaines qui se créent avant de, 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 de pouvoir justement euh, euh, être en, en complète, c'est-à-dire être en immersion dans ces, euh, dans ces centres. Et, et ces, ces, ces enregistrements vidéo ont été, pour certaines situations, pas toutes, euh, mais un peu des situations confuses, ont été, euh, ont été euh, traitées, euh, visualisées par, euh, par euh, les, les spécialistes, les psycho, les pédopsychiatres qui peuvent parfois trancher euh, par rapport à un cri. Est-ce qu'il est, s'agit d'un cri de joie ou de mécontentement Donc, euh, oui, mais... Et, ou, oui, le travail il peut être élargi dans ce sens. Euh, ça n'a pas été fait dans mon cas, mais ça a été remédié par d'autres euh, méthodes. Voilà. Merci. Merci, Madame Laï, pour cette euh, clarification. Donc, euh, je passe à une autre question posée par euh, Madame Masmoudi. Donc, euh, y avait-il des enfants témoins qui n'ont pas ce trouble pour comparer okay. C'est une bonne question. Euh, ou, euh, malheureusement, non. On a envisagé justement cette démarche comparative d'avoir un échantillon d'enfants de autistes et un échantillon d'enfants de, témoins de même âge. Euh, ça, pourquoi ça n'a pas été fait Parce que euh, c'est justement un problème logistique, parce que au cours de travail, parce que c'était un travail où les objectifs s'élargissaient au fur et à mesure de l'avancement du travail. Et, euh, et on a envisagé justement de déposer un, un, une candidature pour un projet pour financer justement tout le travail de terrain et de concrétiser les recommandations qu'on avait proposées. Malheureusement, là, notre candidature n'a n'a pas été retenu, mais un travail similaire par rapport à deux populations, c'est-à-dire population témoin et population autiste, a été fait parallèlement euh, entre U2S et le laboratoire euh, de, de Monastir. Euh, dans un autre cadre, il s'agissait d'un projet ANR, d'où LB, et ça a été fait dans d'autres dans cadres. Voilà. Mais pour mon cas, ça n'a pas été fait, malheureusement. Et merci, Madame Zanet. Donc, euh, juste en fait, euh, une question que je, je viens de poser. En Tunisie, est-ce qu'il y a beaucoup de centres dédiés à ces enfants autistes Parce qu'à ma connaissance, euh, il y a un manque. Il y en a un manque. Justement, beaucoup, euh, oui, il y en a un nombre assez important, mais ça ne couvre pas réellement euh, tous les terri territoires et ça ne couvre pas euh, cette demande euh, euh, qui ne cesse d'augmenter d'une année à une autre. Mmh. Euh, et voilà, il y a un vrai manque. Et même si ces centres ils sont là, il y a un manque justement de, de, de qualité plus que, plus que ça devient un commerce, plus qu'une réflexion sur une prise en charge totale de l'enfant. Est-ce que le, en fait, le ministère de la Santé publique a une idée sur les résultats que vous avez obtenus, les recommandations, pour pouvoir commencer à concevoir un local qui, euh, qui peut être apte pour ces enfants Oui, 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 euh, oui euh, je ne cesse euh, de solliciter euh, de les responsables. Euh, euh, J'ai présenté l'année dernière euh, aussi dans le cadre d'un congrès international euh, pour, euh, pour la pédopsychiatrie. J'ai travaillé des, avec des pédopsychiatres. Je connais aussi des responsables du ministère de la Santé. Euh, ils, savent, euh, ils savent les outputs de mon travail. Euh, je suis toujours partante pour n'importe quel, quel projet. Parfois, je suis sollicitée, des choses démarrées, mais vu un peu la situation, disons, politique, la situation du pays, c'est des choses qui, qui se freinent. Il y a des choses en perspective, euh, mais voilà, vivement, des prochaines collaborations. Euh, 
je suis toujours partante par, euh, par, euh, par, euh, par justement des, des collaborations fructueuses qui peuvent euh, concrétiser, exécuter euh, 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 les résultats du travail, oui. Okay. Donc, une autre question posée par Mme Mejri. Est-ce qu'il y a une volonté pour que l'enfant ait toujours une vue, un accès sur la nature Pensez-vous que la nature a un rôle important et trouvez-vous celle-ci suffisamment présente C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'il y a une volonté pour que l'enfant ait toujours une vue, un accès sur la nature euh, euh, La volonté... La volonté en tant qu'architecte, oui, mais c'est la volonté, c'est-à-dire la volonté dans ce qui est actuellement présent dans les centres, il n'y a pas réellement. Euh, c'est vrai, on peut trouver un jardin, on peut trouver, euh, on peut trouver ces éléments naturels qui sont présents hein, dans le centre, mais généralement, ces centres, rarement où on trouve des centres euh, construits pour euh, les autistes, par exemple le cas de Sous le centre Les Colombes de Sousse, il était construit, dédié spécialement aux autistes, sauf que dans l'usage quotidien, euh, cette variable, elle est ignorée. Et on est toujours dans cette... Euh, il faut que l'enfant soit concentré par rapport à son travail. Et, et, et ce qui existe réellement sur terrain, c'est généralement des villas ou des maisons, ou des, app des appartements, bon, rarement, mais c'est des maisons réhabiliter, transformer vers des centres spécialisés. Et cette variable, elle n'est pas très présente, elle n'est pas au centre de la réflexion. C'est pour ça que je, dis, je proposais que ces espaces soient, euh, soient réfléchis préalablement dans ce sens. Euh, on peut trouver des jardins, mais par exemple, l'enfant, il est rarement dehors, soit pour des conditions euh, météorologiques ou sinon... Euh, par un manque euh, voilà, d'organisation, c'est-à-dire qu'il ne s'agit pas d'une séance ou d'une activité euh, euh, journalière ou hebdomadaire ou un jour sur deux où on peut faire, euh, il suffit de faire euh, un jardin de potage ou une activité, on inclure cette activité euh, dans, le, euh, dans un peu l'ordre du jour ou un, dans l'ordre pédagogique, un journalier pour que ça soit présent. Mais actuellement, ce n'est pas très, très présent, d'après mon enquête. OK. Donc, euh, je passe à la dernière question posée par Mme euh, Rilplé. Est-ce possible de transposer une partie de la démarche pour d'autres populations différentes, par exemple les personnes âgées avec Parkinson euh, Transposer, peut-être il faut d'abord commencer par une euh, démarche comparative parce que, par exemple, certaines euh, démarches ou études euh, publiées euh, récemment euh, essaient de transposer justement euh, les directives par rapport à, aux personnes euh, atteintes de la maladie d'Alzheimer euh, sur euh, les autistes. Euh, comparer ce qui se passe avec les personnes âgées et le transposer. Il y avait ce, ce sens contraire, finalement. Généralement, ils ne sont pas euh, nombreuses. Et généralement, c'est le même spécialiste qui travaillait beaucoup sur euh, cette population et qui collaborait, par exemple, avec un designer d'espace et essayait d'avoir euh, euh, cette démarche. Euh, hum, je ne suis pas sûre que les choses peuvent être euh, totalement transposables parce que c'est lié à la perception. Et cette perception, hum, elle, elle dépend de la personne, elle dépend. Euh, c'est un trouble de développement, donc c'est très. Je ne pense pas qu'il faut, il faut se méfier de ce genre de. À mon sens, il faut se méfier à ce genre de transposition. Il faut les vérifier d'abord. Okay, merci, Madame Sanem, pour, euh, pour cette présentation aussi intéressante et ces clarifications oui, que vous avez provoquées. Euh, merci aussi aux participants pour ces questions aussi pertinentes. Et je cède la parole à Madame Sanem. Thank you very much, uh, Sanem. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. So I would uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, uh, and uh, special thanks for... Uh, our uh, 
speakers, Professor Brando and uh, Dr. Sanal Ayer. Uh, I just want to uh, conclude uh, by um, saying that uh, it was really amazing to uh, organize this first seminar. It will be the first of a long series of seminars of hope. Uh, and um, um, special thanks for uh, our uh, executive committee. So uh, thank you very much, Safra Shabouh, uh, Najla, and uh, Iman Majri, and uh, also for our ch vice chair woman. So Sundis uh, Hamami, thank you very much for all of you uh, for being here. And I hope uh, that will be um, a first step uh, for a long uh, and sustainable collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you, you for organizing. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Safa. Thank you. Thanks.